Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Well, I picked up some old books recently for free, which is the best price, uh, from an emeritus professor who is cleaning out his office on campus. And I thought I would share them with you. I love old books, especially old technical books. So let's have a look. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. They not only do PCBs and flex PCBs, they also have 3D printing service and injection molding service. They do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication. They also have a thriving maker community where you can share projects and check out what other people are doing. For your next project, head on over to PCB Way. Well, here's kind of the, the least interesting of the bunch. You notice this is Logitech IO and there's three of them. And it says Logitech IO Digital Notebook. And it's a page and it's really hard to see through the camera, but this page has a lot of funky random looking dots in the background. Now this came out in the Windows XP era and the idea was that you had a special pen which as it wrote in ink would record the position of these dots and digitize what you were writing. So you could plug that pen into your computer and have a digital copy of what you wrote in your notebook. Of course today uh, we have pretty good handwriting recognition so we don't need this. Uh, the pin wasn't there and the cables and everything like that. But the three new notebooks were, and I didn't want to just, you know, junk these, uh, throw them in the recycling bin because somebody's liable to need them. Uh, I don't, I don't think I'll get a pin. You can get those on eBay for around 20 bucks, but um, I just thought I would get these maybe pass them on to somebody who could use them. It was kind of an interesting technology at the time. Uh, the next least interesting thing is some graph paper, but I use this all the time. It's still nice for drawing ideas out on, and my writing is kind of like chicken scratch, so it helps make my writing more legible. And this is about half used up, but there's still a lot of good pages there. Okay, our next book is a DC Power Supply Handbook by Hewlett Packard. This is Application Note 90A. And I've got the book kind of propped up here to reduce the glare. You know, if it's by Hewlett Packard, it's a good book. It still has these business reply mail, no postage necessary type things in here. Um, you can send them a literature request. You know, before everything was online, you could write to a company and uh, some of the materials they would send you for free and some had a small cost like this, 250. It's the way technical materials were distributed. And this is copyright 1970 by Hewlett Packard. So if we flip through here, it goes through all things about, you know, power supplies of that vintage, how they work, the different types of regulation, that type of thing. So this is very useful if you're working on older equipment, um, you know, to be able to look up how your particular type of power supply works or that section of the power supply. Very handy reference. Here is another really good reference, the Zener Diode Handbook by Motorola. This tells you all about Zener Diodes. This is the first edition it looks like. Copyright 1967. This is oh, about a year and a few months older than me. So let's talk, you know, so Zener Diodes were still newish at this time and they're telling you how they're built and how they work, and um, that type of thing. Very interesting. It's kind of neat here. It shows you how in what looks like a trans four-legged transistor can, how they've got other parts in there to make up a reference amplifier assembly. And, oh, this one is super handy. It's a Howard Sam's book you know sam's publication i think they're still around uh it says number 16 two, one, three, three, three. it's a transistor substitution handbook and 
Copyright 1976. The first one came out in 1961. And this is, book is basically a huge table of cross-referencing one transistor part number to a variety of others. And of course, this doesn't mean that for every application uh, you can re use any of these transistors to replace this transistor, but it is a very darn good place to start. And then you kind of look at the specifications of both if you can find them and uh, be on your way. Now the thing is, they based this on all the, the data sheets at the time. A lot of these are very hard to find or impossible to find now. So this book is worth its weight in gold if you're working on vintage equipment. That is great. Understanding Transformers and Coils by Edward Buckstein. Again, Howard Sam's catalog number TAC-1, $1.95. Uh, this is the third printing from 1965. And this is really some practical information about transformers and coils. So it's not a lot of this you know, overly in-depth stuff you would find in a textbook. Uh, it's more useful stuff that a technician or you know, engineer who's building and fixing stuff would, would need. Very helpful book. It's missing the front cover. You can see the back cover there. It's missing the front cover. But the important stuff is still inside. And here we have the Sylvania uh, slash GTE uh, transistor clinic handbook price two dollars revised may 1967 again older than i am and if you look through this book you see that um, it's talking about transistors in general how they're made the pn and np junctions um, you know the current flow through them that type of thing different transistor circuits again this is all very practical information testing transistors transistor circuit applications, and a lot of these applications are things that were in vogue at the time, like you know TVs and, and things like that. Very nice book. Now, this book um, is less practical, but I thought it was interesting. I mean, just look at all these cool computers on the cover. Electrical Systems for Computer Installations, edited by Robert J. Lawry, and the staff of the Electrical Construction and Maintenance Magazine. And when was this one copyrighted? Um, copyright 1988. So this is relatively new. This would have been published after I just got out of high school. So the fundamentals of UPS systems, you know, power supplies, you know, distribution of power to big computer rooms. This type of thing. It's just like you know, industrial scale computer rooms with big racks of computers and things like that. So again, not practical for anything I need. I just thought it was interesting. And television technology today, edited by Theodore Rezewiski or something like that. Some I uh, Triple E book. Yeah, boy, that marker really bled through there, didn't it? And. Copyright 1984. So, cover CATV, broadband communications, satellites, advanced television systems. So, it's a lot of practical information about how different parts of the television transmission system work. But this was interesting. You know, the theory behind how the television signal operates, that type of thing. Even projector televisions when they were three projected CRTs. Uh, the last book out of this bunch is Introduction to Historical Geology, which has nothing to do with what I cover on my channel. As I said, I love old books. Uh, this originally belonged to Theodore Sieberling, uh, MSM 33. Uh, the university I work at was originally known as Missouri School of Mines from the 1890s through the 
the early 60s, and then it was University of Missouri Rolla, and about 15 years ago, we became the uh, Missouri University of Science and Technology. So, so it was originally owned by a guy who graduated in the class of 33. So this is the third edition, the fifth printing, and copyright 1928. So originally copyrighted in 1916, this printing is 1928. So my dad would have been about three years old at the time. Pretty neat. So this gives you, you know, a lot of basic geological information, which is kind of an interesting subject. You know, a lot of these uh, hand-drawn charts and stuff like that, you know, some which were standard quality photographs to be printed at the time. They used to rather coarse screen to get them to print and so they're not great by today's standards, but there's a lot to be said for older books like this. A lot of good information. Now along these lines, I'll show you a few more that I've gotten previously that I really like. The C programming language book. Um, and you'll notice this one says right here, Eastern Economy Edition, which means it was printed in India or for the Indian market. Uh, the paper's thinner. Notice you can see the bleed through, but it was designed to be uh, less expensive. Yeah, Prentice Hall of India, Private Limited. This book, the C Programming Language book by Kerrigan and Ritchie, is one of the best programming books ever written because um, it gets to the point. It teaches you how to use the various aspects of the language without trying to get into every detail. Uh, you can get into so much detail that it makes it really hard to get the, the general point and learn how to use language. So, very good book. If you have a chance to pick up a copy of this, I would recommend it. I know this is out in digital format, but the paper book is nice. Uh, a companion to this by AT&T Bell Labs uh, is the C Programmer's Handbook. And uh, this... The idea of this book is not to teach you how to program in C, it is a reference manual. And generally reference manuals are terrible at teaching you things. But if you're like, oh, okay, how, how do you format a C string? This is where you look. You reserve keywords, data types, character constants, assignment operators, you know, how function calls works, how the preprocessor works, etc. Very nice book. And here's one of my uh, favorites. I got this book about 25 years ago at a uh, auction from an old fellow that died. And this is part of his uh, college textbooks, James Lyle, Chemistry and Agriculture. And again, this isn't really a, an area of main interest to me, but it's a very well-written book. Um, let's see here if we can find a copyright date. So first edition was 1926, first reprint 1927. Again, my dad would have been one or two years old when this was printed. And it is a good synopsis of what was known about uh, the chemistry of agriculture and plant growth and things at the time. You know, so I've had this bookmark in here forever. Um, what this section talks about is the carbon cycle. And, uh, you know, they're referencing things, if you look at the reference here, from uh, the 1800s even back to 1779, 1774. But these few pages here give a good explanation of the carbon cycle uh, without all the politics that get involved with it today. I guess it goes back a few more pages to here. It starts here on page 47. This is a great book. I've read through it a few times. Um, it's just really interesting to read these old books. I think they did a lot better job uh, writing about technical subjects at the time. This is a very good quality photograph for a book like this.
This would be kind of expensive to add. Where the nitrogen comes from, cereal grains, sugar and sugar crops, that type of thing. Great book. So if you ever have a chance to pick up some old college textbooks, they are much better than what we have today. Uh, they're a fun read, and you can usually pick these up very cheap because most people don't want them. Well, I hope you've enjoyed browsing through this set of books I got for free. Uh, I really like things like this. You can always learn something new. And uh, older technical books really were much better written than modern ones. They get to the point, and there's not all the extra fluff that gets in the way of learning the subject really great. If you have a chance to pick some of these up, I would recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, any questions or comments, just leave in that comment section down there below. I would love to hear from you. Thanks to everyone who helped support the channel. I really appreciate it. And until next time, bye.